slab wave guides. In this video, I'm going to briefly explain the physics of guided waves and slab wave guides so that you have a better understanding when we get into analyzing them. And our discussion will start with refractive index. And so the refractive index is a factor. It's the factor by which a wave slows down inside of a medium relative to the speed of light in vacuum. So what we're looking at here is out in the white area, we have a wave in air, and then it enters some kind of dielectric medium, and then it exits again. And we can notice something. We can notice how fast the wave is traveling. And when it enters this medium, we see that it slows down. And then it speeds up again when it leaves. We notice that when the wave slows down, the wavelength also gets shorter. So the refractive index in this medium would be higher. So a higher refractive index, wave slows down, and so does the wavelength. But notice what does not change, and that is the frequency. This red ball is going up and down on these humps, and that's cycling at the same speed. So frequency is constant, how fast the wave is oscillating. But the speed that it's moving changes and its wavelength changes, all in proportion to this refractive index parameter, n. Snell's law. When a wave hits an interface and it passes through that interface, that wave can change its direction. And that change in direction is described by Snell's law. So the way this works, in the xy plane, we have an interface between some medium with refractive index n1, and in the second medium has a refractive index n2. If we have a wave coming in at an angle relative to the surface normal, we'll call that theta1, angle of wave one, then the wave in medium two will have a different angle, theta two. And the relation between these four parameters is related through what's called Snell's law. And so at an interface, waves can change their direction. The only exception to that, if we have a wave that hits this interface exactly at normal incidence, it will exit exactly at normal incidence. But as long as there's any angle involved, the angle will change. And notice, the angle on one side is always smaller than the angle at the other side. That's a very interesting observation. That leads to something that we call the critical angle. What if the angle, the larger angle, is exactly 90 degrees? Then the angle on the other side would be what we call the critical angle. And in fact, it becomes impossible to have any angles on this side of the interface larger than that. We can only get angles smaller. And so we can derive an expression for the critical angle. We simply set theta one to 90 degrees. And then we can calculate this other angle because with this set to 90 degrees, we have the critical angle for theta two and we have an expression. So here's our final expression for calculating critical angle and looking at what's inside this inverse sign, we make a conclusion that we can only have a critical angle over here if the refractive index N2 is greater than N1. If the opposite is true, if N1 is the greater refractive index, we would have a critical angle, but it would be on the first side, not the second side of the interface. Here is something very interesting and very useful about the critical angle. Let's say now our wave is incident from below, not above, and the angle is greater than the critical angle. Well, if the angle down here is always smaller than it is up here, but the angle up here is at 90 degrees when the angle down here is at the critical angle, if we have a larger angle, there is no angle up here. And in that case, the wave is completely reflected from the interface, and we call that total internal reflection. Now let's say we have some material, a slab of material with refractive index N2, and we sandwich it between two different slabs of material that have a different refractive index. If N1 and N3 are both lower 
than N2, then there will be an angle where we get total internal reflection and waves can stay trapped inside this region N2. And this is waveguiding. And waveguiding happens in dielectric structures due to total internal reflection. Optical fibers, that's by far the most common waveguide on Earth. There are probably millions of kilometers of optical fiber, and it's a piece of glass. And at the center of that glass is a slightly changed, it's a doped version of the glass that has a slightly higher refractive index, and that keeps light trapped inside the fiber due to total internal reflection. So a little 3D view of what a slab waveguide would look like is something like this. It's a thin layer of material that has a higher refractive index than anything around it. And I'm showing different colors here. N1 and N3 don't have to be the same. They can be different materials. They just have to be a lower refractive index than N2 so that we can get total internal reflection to keep our electromagnetic wave trapped in that region. Something else has to happen because we can have many rays in this slab region. So let's look at one of them. So we have total internal reflection. It'll reflect off that first interface. It'll come down, total internal reflection. It'll reflect off the second interface and it keeps doing that. And that's fine and that can happen. However, we have to look at this point to a common point where it repeats. As the wave is propagating, it is, in, seeing a delay, it's accumulating phase. And the amount of phase it accumulates from one point to an equivalent point over here has to be an integer multiple of two pi. So there has to be an exact integer number of wave cycles from here to here. If that is not the case, then this ray would become out of phase with maybe another ray right next to it. And so they would interfere and this wave would escape from the waveguide. So this means that there's only discrete angles that are possible in this guide. And so this is the origin of there being only discrete modes allowed inside of a waveguide. So let's say we have one of those modes and that angle is theta. So that's one of these special angles. Well, it would, it would bounce around and it would essentially march along this guide, even though it's bouncing around with some kind of effective speed. And we can characterize that with an effective refractive index. And we will multiply that by what's called the free space wave number. This is just two pi over the wavelength. And that's a number that helps us describe how quickly the wave oscillates when multiplied by the effective refractive index. Now this product will appear inside of our cosine that's describing the, the wave. And so we will call this a phase constant and we give it a single value beta. So beta is the phase constant that really tells us how quickly the wave is oscillating, how quickly it accumulates phase as it propagates. So what we did here is just look at simple ray tracing picture to figure out that only discrete modes are possible in a waveguide. Now the ray tracing picture is sort of a hand waving picture and we would like to analyze a slab waveguide rigorously. When we do that, here's a variety of answers that we get. And you can use this to check your code because this is an actual simulation. So we have a slab of material with refractive index N2, and it is surrounded by two mediums with refractive index one. So that means it's air above and below. So we have a slab of material buried in air. Now I let the thickness of this slab be three wavelengths large. And so what we do is we feed this information into our simulation, a description of the guide, our wavelength, and it calculates all of these discrete modes that are allowed. And each one has its own effective refractive index describing how quickly it travels through the guide. Notice this fundamental mode has the highest effective refractive index. That would mean that the fundamental mode is traveling the most slowly. The higher order modes, we call them, are traveling more quickly. Another way we could think of this effective refractive index is if we look at the distribution of energy within the mode. The more energy it puts in the high index region, the higher the effective refractive index will be. In fact, it's up to weighted average. If you could integrate this and figure out the energy inside which refractive index medium, you could calculate the effective index this way. 
And notice these higher order modes, they're putting a little bit more energy out into the low index regions. And so the effective refractive index becomes lower. But notice the shapes of the modes, and that's quite interesting. Our fundamental mode has one hump. So we would call this the first order mode. Second order mode has two humps. And our eyes would actually be blind to the fact that these are 180 degrees out of phase. We would just see two bright spots. That's a second order mode. Third order mode has three humps. And again, our eyes would be blind to the phase of this. We would see three bright spots. And guess what? The fourth order mode will have four bright spots. The fifth order mode will have five bright spots. And this goes, and at some point, there is no more higher order modes. And we would call those modes cut off. So every waveguide supports some number of modes. And these all travel at different speeds. Well, one thing we would like to do is not have these things travel at different speeds because that leads to something called dispersion. And if we insert this nice crisp square wave pulse, but then all of a sudden the different modes travel at different speeds, that distorts those nice crisp square edges. So what we'll do is we will pinch this down so we have a thinner waveguide until only this fundamental mode exists. And we've eliminated that type of dispersion. And so we can travel much more farther in a waveguide without distorting those nice crisp square edges. And so that's a use of a simulation. We would like to design these very often to be single moded, only contain a single mode, or if they're multi-moded, maybe we want to learn about those other modes. Slab waveguides versus channel waveguides. So we've looked at slab waveguides. That means there's confinement on only one direction. The waves are free to spread out or do whatever they want to this direction. And also in and out of the screen, they're free to spread. A channel waveguide now, it has confinement not only in the original direction of our slab, but also now horizontally. Confinement in two directions, but the wave is still allowed to spread in and out of the screen. And so it's a pipe. Channel waveguides are pipes. Slab waveguides are not pipes because the wave is free to spread out in this extra direction. So in this analysis, we're analyzing slab waveguides. Reason being is because we can reduce this to a one dimensional problem just in the cross section of the slab. Channel waveguides are inherently a two dimensional simulation, which is for a later subject because there's confinement in two directions and we would need a two dimensional grid to draw a picture of that guide and to simulate it. Here, we only need a one dimensional grid to analyze a slab waveguide. So it's a perfect example and slab waveguides are immensely useful, especially in optics. The last thing we'll do here is look at the mathematical form of a guided wave. This will help simplify the math. So on the left here, I am drawing a slab waveguide. So we have our slab, sometimes that would be called the core, and we have our lower refractive index exterior that sometimes we would call the cladding. This direction straight through the slab waveguide, this will be our X direction. This will be the direction it turns out we can reduce our simulation to. We're going to let this guided wave travel in the Z direction. That's what I'm showing here. So we have these wave oscillations in the Z direction. There will be no wave oscillations in the vertical direction. Otherwise, it would be pushing power out of the waveguide. So we won't see that. We might see that within the core, but definitely not outside. The waves can only sort of decay away from the interface like we saw in those guided modes. Now in the Y direction, absolutely nothing is happening. Our field is perfectly uniform. The slab is perfectly uniform. And so it'll turn out any derivative in the y direction, we will just set to zero and that will greatly simplify the math. We also notice in the z direction, the slab waveguide does not change. And in fact, the form of our solution does not change in the z direction. It just accumulates phase. So this is suggesting that our solution has a specific mathematical form. And here it is. We have this overall electric field, and it is a function of X, Y, and Z. It can change in all three directions. But it turns out, just due to the symmetry of our slab waveguide, we know that the form of the solution, these guided modes, will be written 
in this form. It's the product of two different terms. And it's very interesting that it, it takes this type of form and very useful mathematically. This last term, this is a complex exponential, e to the minus j beta z, and that beta is the phase constant we talked about. So this is really the wave oscillations. That's talking about the wiggles here and how quickly it accumulates phase as it propagates. This sort of envelope or amplitude term is only a function of x. It's not a function of y because everything's uniform in the y direction. Nothing can change. So this sort of amplitude envelope, if you will, is only a function of x. And that's what contains pictures of our modes. And so a guided mode has some profile in the x direction. And then from there, it's uniform in the y direction. But in the z direction, it stays the same. So we have whatever the mode looks like, it stays that way. It just marches along, collecting phase in the z direction. And that way, it's quite boring. But this mathematical form will be very useful when we apply this to Maxwell's equations. It will help us simplify things down. Also, that this y direction, nothing is changing. And setting any derivatives in the y direction to 0 will also be very useful. So that's it for this lecture. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.